from our audience sort of three, as I said, three kinds of questions. The first has to do with um, China's system uh, and whether or not it's too brittle. And we heard some of that from the commentators, uh, but you know, in your telling, Xi Jinping still seems relatively pragmatic. Uh, the system seems adaptable. Um, it, can you d explain that a little bit further? Second type of questions had to do with sort of uh, whether or not the description of China's economic performance um, is, is overly rosy. And, and they point to, people ask about China's technology abilities, questions about debt and productivity, uh, and what can you say about what is the proper standard to judge China's economic performance? And third are questions about uh, uh, US-China relations in the international system, a Cold War, um, you know, what happens if, if the US tries to lock China out of SWIFT or really clamps down on technology much further than it's done so far, is this really gonna constrain China and, and, and uh, lead to a popping of, of the bubble? So let's turn things back to you, uh, thank, uh, and uh, get some initial reactions from the commentators and from our audience questions. Tom? So first of all, uh, to, to Logan's point um, on the costs of deleveraging. Um, so uh, I think that's completely right. Deleveraging uh, has not been a painless or a cost-free process. Um, and it's certainly true that if we look at alternative indicators, China's growth in 2016, 2017, 2018 may well have been significantly below what the official data suggests, kind of macro cost of deleveraging. Um, the point I would make, though, um, is that the fact that China's leaders were willing to embark on a painful deleveraging campaign is itself uh, an evidence of their willingness to grasp the nettle, right? Um, what are the choices? The choices are don't delever, continue growing really fast, but then have a financial crisis, or attempt to manage the problems and take some costs now. Um, most economies around the world go for option two, right? They let things run and then they have a crisis. China moved early and accepted some costs. So I think that in itself goes to some of the, the strengths of the Chinese economic and financial system. Um, Anne, I thought, made a really interesting point about where financial crises come from, and they come when there are, we run out of intangible value for the financial system to monetize. Um, and I think what that speaks to um, really is a question about China's underlying growth story, right? So if we really think that China's growth story is over, then yes, we would be extremely worried about a financial crisis because the resources which banks, corporations, and government have to paper over the cracks would be flat or even shrinking. And that's when the crisis happens. Um, so underpinning some of my optimism um, is that more positive longer term view on China's outlook, uh, forecasts for China's growth, which I think is sort of broadly in line with where Joyce's numbers came in on where China would be in 2030 uh, and when, where uh, Helga's IMF numbers would come in uh, for China around 2030. I don't think China has run out of intangible value to generate. Um, so uh, we had a question from the audience about brittleness. Um, and uh, we didn't get to talking about the, the sort of the social side of, of China. Um, but I think this is also an area where we underestimate the robustness, right? Um, for as long as I've been thinking and writing about China, uh, there's been a story that there's been a kind of a Faustian pact between the Chinese people and the Communist Party, right? Uh, you give us growth and we will give you control and we won't contest that control. Um, and the story has always been, well, if growth disappears and unemployment rises, then look out because there's going to be social instability. And that's why China is so determined to grow at 8% a year, uh, even though there's these costs in terms of increasing imbalances. Well, in the first half of 2020, we've had a stress test on that as well, right? Um, the economy has shrunk 6.8%. Household income has contracted. Unemployment has risen. Um, and if we look at most Chinese provinces, we don't see social instability. Um, so I think the story about brittleness in China's society, um, I think actually uh, is considerably overstated. 
Uh, and let me just take on that last question uh, from the audience about a Cold War. Um, so um, I think if we went back to 1978, uh, when uh, Deng Xiaoping started the reform and opening process, if the US at that point had said no, um, you're not coming into the global economy, we won't trade with you, we won't invest in you, we won't share our technology and expertise, then that would have been a crushing blow to China's early reform ambitions. Um, and maybe the global economy today would look very different to how it actually does. Um, but here we are in 2020, China is the second biggest economy in the world, the biggest exporter in the world, an exporter increasingly of capital to many emerging markets, um, multinationals uh, here in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in Korea are deeply invested in their China relationship, both as a source of supply and as a source of demand. Um, so it's clear that there has been a change in the way the world views China. Um, it's very clear here in the US, in Europe, in other parts of the world, there has been a shift in focus from thinking about the opportunities to worrying about the risks and, and thinking about how to, how, how to manage them. But is that going to mean a, a decoupling? Is that going to mean a Cold War in a meaningful sense where economic ties are comprehensively broken? Um, I find that um, very hard to imagine. Um, so I'm afraid I didn't get to all of the amazing comments we had from the panel or all of the interesting questions uh, from the audience, uh, but I hope that um, deals with some of, the, some of the big points. And I'll hand back to Scott.